this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth and we receive your word written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. Thank you for all that you bring forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. In the last two sessions, we talked about how we're to clothe ourselves with the garments of God and how it is of a necessity that we clothe ourselves and not be found naked before him and that we are walking in the ways of the Lord. And of absolutely it's a necessity if we are going to be ready for the marriage of the Lamb that we are clean and white. And we talked about this a little bit, but we're going to talk about that tonight, being clean and white to be clothed in righteousness. We see in Revelation 19, verse 7 and 8, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife, who would be the bride, who is the church, hath made herself ready, prepared and ready. That's the responsibility of the body of Christ. That's your responsibility and my responsibility. And it goes on and says, And to her it was granted, or this really means given, you notice, you're here for the first time in the lower window is a Strong's number keyed into Strong's concordance, a Greek or Hebrew word, depending upon whether in the Old or New Testament, and information about this. This is really talking about being given. To her it was given that she might be arrayed or might be clothed, is the way this should be translated, in fine linen. The reason we say this is because this is a subjunctive mood verb. The subjunctive mood in the Greek expresses a statement that is contrary to fact. In other words, it's not that it's automatic that she's going to be arrayed or clothed in fine linen, but that she might be arrayed in fine linen if the conditions are met. And this being arrayed in fine linen is important that it it's get accomplished because the middle voice in the Greek means it's for the person's benefit. Though otherwise, we must make sure we're meeting the conditions to be clothed or arrayed in fine linen for our benefit, because that's necessary to be ready for the marriage of the Lamb. And then it describes about what this fi fine, lin fine linen is going to produce. Clean and white. If you've got the fine linen on, you're going to be clean and you're going to be white before the Lord. <laughs> clean and pure, holy, we're going to be white, brilliant, shining forth because of the tremendous whiteness and got rid of all the evil out of our life. And then he says the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Not a good translation because this particular word here is not the word for righteousness, it's the word here, dikai yoma, which means to a righteous acts or the righteous deeds in the Greek. This is why we put Young's up here. He corrects these errors. It's talking about the righteous acts or the righteous deeds of the saints because as you do the word of righteousness then you're going to see the cleansing is going to come forth and you're going to become white as snow. That's because we must obey God's word to produce righteousness. Righteousness is what we do of righteousness. And it's important to understand that when we're born again, we get a spirit that is right with God, but there's more to righteousness than that. 1 John 3, 7, let ch little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth, this is a present tense verb, meaning ongoing, continuous action. He that is doing, that's why Young's translates it correctly, is doing the righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. Doing righteousness is doing righteous acts or righteous deeds. And the fine linen was the righteous deeds of the ones of, of the church, which produces the cleanness and the whiteness, being as white as snow. Now we're going to talk about what it's necessary to be clean and to be white as snow. That causes you to be clothed with these linen linen garments, to be righteous before the Lord because of the righteousness that we have been doing. Genesis chapter 35, a scripture we looked at before, but we'll look at it again. In verse 1, God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, 
Bethel means house of God. Well, that's why we need to come to church, to praise and worship him and to hear the word of God. And he said, and dwell there. It means you should be there as much as you can be there to hear the word, to be abiding in the presence of God, worshiping him and hearing his word. And make there an altar unto God. That's worship unto him. God wants you to worship him. As you worship him, you minister to him, he'll minister back unto you. And then he goes on and says, Jacob said to his household and to all that are with him, put away the strange gods that are among you. Anything that's contrary to God as your source becomes a strange God, an idol. Put it all away. And be clean. Now when it says be clean, this is a word that is, has a stem in the Hebrew called the pale stem. That is a stem which describes kind of like the middle voice. They call it reflexive. That it's reflexive in the Hebrew, meaning that it is for your own benefit. That's why Young's translates it, cleanse yourselves, because you're doing it, you're for yourself. This is also an imperative mood. This isn't a nice suggestion, this is a command. So he's telling you, put away these strange gods and cleanse yourselves. It's a command for every one of us. And so we're the ones that are responsible to do what the Word says in order to see this cleansing occur. And change your garments. And we talked about changing the garments, putting on the garments of God, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ through the Word of God in us. And we spent uh, two sessions talking about that subject. We come over to Leviticus chapter 10. We must be clean. In Leviticus chapter 10, verse 9, he says, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink. Thou, nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. And that you may put a difference between the holy and the unholy, and between the unclean and the clean. Alcohol, or wine that's alcoholic, or strong drink, is unholy and it's unclean. You want to have nothing to do with it whatsoever. This is a command to not drink wine nor any strong drink whatsoever. Alcohol, and we've done a series on that, should be totally eliminated from your life. It is unclean. You partake of that, you will be unclean and you will not be white before the Lord whatsoever. We see over in Leviticus chapter 17, Verse 15. Every soul that eateth that which died of itself or that which was torn with beasts, whether it be of his own country or stranger, he shall both wash his clothes. And this is talking about the dietary laws, so meaning something that would be unclean that would come into you if you took something unclean in you. And from a New Testament standpoint, that means anything that you would take to be unclean, what are you supposed to do? You got any uncleanness on you? You got to get washed. You wash your clothes. You get rid of that. And the word for wash here is the word kabas in the Hebrew. It means to wash, performing the work of a fuller. F-U-L-L-E-R is not fuller, but it means really fuller in the Hebrew. A fuller was one who would wash a garment as, and continue to wash it until it was all, all the impurities, everything was out to make it absolutely as white as possible, as white as snow. That's what God wants. He wants you to wash yourself of anything that has caused you to be unclean in any aspect in your life. It's absolutely essential. He says, if he wash them not, nor bathe his flesh, or wash it off, then he shall bear his iniquity. That tells you something. If you don't wash and get clean and get rid of this uncleanness out of your life, you're going to bear the iniquity. That means the curse will be upon you because sin produces iniquity it's of the heart, which is what brings a curse. In fact, we know the iniquities of the fathers are visited upon the children of the third and fourth generation. Therefore, we need to make sure we're washed. Otherwise, you're going to be bearing the iniquity. The curse will be upon you in your life. In Numbers, chapter 8, verse 6, Take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them. The Levites were the priests. In applying this for the New Testament today, 
who are priests. All of us are. We're born again. We are now priests. Everybody's a king and a priest unto God. So the priests now, which are you and me, are to be cleansed. Everybody is to be cleansed. This is what thou shalt do to them, to cleanse them. You sprinkle the water of purifying upon them. That would be the word of God. Let them shave all their flesh. That means you're going to cut off all that is the works of the flesh is what that's pointing towards. You crucify the flesh daily. You wash. This is this fooler. Washing all your clothes. Get everything out of you. You only want God's garments on. You want to put off everything that's no good. And we talked about all the things you put off. You put off the anger, the bitterness, the resentment, the, all these evil things that are not of the Lord. And so make themselves clean. God wants every one of us to be clean. And remember, this is what's mandatory and a requirement to be clean and white, to have this fine linen, to be ready for the marriage of the Lamb. Otherwise, you won't be in that company. In Numbers chapter 8, verse 21, the Levites, the priests, were purified, and they washed their clothes. And Aaron offered them as an offering before the Lord, and Aaron made an atonement for them to cleanse them. So here, these are the priests. They got purified. They washed their clothes. They did the right thing. And notice what it says after that. And after that, went the Levites in to do their service in the tabernacle of the congregation before Aaron, before his sons. As the Lord had commanded Moses concerning the Levites, so did they unto them. Notice, before they could go into to do the service of the tabernacle and serve God and be used of Him. This is after that. So what did they have to do before that? They had to get purified and washed. If you don't get cleansed and washed, you're not even a candidate to be serving the Lord. It was after that that then the priests could go in to serve the Lord. We need to get washed clean and purified before we attempt to try to be in the service for the Lord because you've got to be clean and holy. In 2 Samuel chapter 22, Verse 21. This is in David's psalm of thanksgiving. When he's, he defeated his enemies, the Lord, of course, did that, accomplish that for him. Look what he says in verse 21. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, hath he recompensed me. So God's rewards was because of his righteousness and the cleanness of his hands. When you walk in righteousness, that's what produces cleanness in your life. You're not going to have any unrighteousness. You're going to get rid of that. You're going to walk in righteousness. And that's how you get rewarded. You're going to be rewarded in your life as you are walking in righteousness, as you have cleanness of hands in your life. Verse 25, Therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in His eyesight. It's not according to the way you see it. It's according to the way God sees it. And you want to make sure that you're looking at yourself as God is looking at you, not yourself, and think that you're okay in your own, in your own self. No. We've got to see according to His eyesight. So we've got to get cleansed. We come to 2 Chronicles chapter 29. And first we look in verse 5. Again, we see speaking to the Levites. Who are the Levites? The priests. And that speaks of all of us today. He said unto them, Hear me, you Levites, you priests, sanctify now yourselves. We are to be sanctifying ourselves. We're going to work out our own salvation. And sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers. What house does God live in now? You and I are the temple. And so, we're to sanctify you and me, the temple of the Lord. And notice, he said, Carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. In the Old Testament temple, there was the Holy of Holies, where God was dwelling, the holy place, and then the outer court. They're all type of spirit, soul, and body. God is our, our spirit is what's right with Him, type of uh, the Holy of Holies. The holy place is likened to the soul, outer court likened to the body. Therefore, carrying the filthiness out of the holy place speaks of a cleansing, the holy cleansing your soul of all this filthiness. All the filthiness has to come out of your soul realm, which is your mind, your will, your emotions. That's what it's all made up of. All the things that have affected you 
in your mind or your will or your emotions, things that you've uh, been victimized to or sins you've committed or even things that have come in from inheritance that have affected you in these ways. So all the filthiness, it has to be brought out. So you're going to go after getting all this filthiness out of your life. So, we come to verse 15. They gathered their brethren. They sanctified themselves in obedience to what God said. And they came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. So because they were told to do this, and here's their response, and this is pointing towards the New Testament, what should we be doing ourselves? We gather the brethren. We've gathered us right here. Everybody in the body of Christ should be gathered together to sanctify themselves. And notice, this is a commandment of the king. Jesus Christ is commanding every single one of us to be cleansed, to be holy, to be pure, to be righteous before him. By the word of the Lord, to cleanse the house of the Lord. God is speaking to the body of Christ to come to the place of being clean and to be holy, to be white, to be righteous before the Lord. We've got to get cleansed. Everybody's got to cleanse out all of the filthiness. So what did the priests do? That's you and me. They went into the inner part of the house of the Lord. That's on the inside of you. That would be in the soulish realm. To cleanse it. And they brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord. You need to take a good look inside at yourself and see what's all the uncleanness that's in me. What all filthy things need to be gotten out of me. Do I have a problem with anger? Do I have a problem with resentment? Do I have a problem with bitterness? Do I have a problem with depression? Do I have a problem with fear? Do I have a problem with anxiety? Have I had a problem with all the emotional hurts and wounds and damage? I have a problem in my will, rebellion, disobedience, on and on. All these things. What's on the inside of me that's not of the Lord? That's filthiness that needs to be brought out. So they went into the inner part of the house of the Lord, just like you're going to go inside you and take a good look to cleanse it, and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord. So you've got to be taking a good look and get all this out. So the Levites took it out. They got rid of it. Verse 17, they began on the first day of the first month to sanctify, and on the eighth day of the month they came, came they to the porch of the Lord, so they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. Eight is the number of new beginnings in Scripture, meaning that once you get all this evil out of you, all the filthiness, deal with the sin, works of the flesh, all the things that are wrong, as well as casting out all the demons that are filthy, unclean spirits in you. It'll be like a new day, a new beginning in your life. It is a process to do it, and God wants every one of us to get set free. So they went unto Hezekiah the king and said, We've cleansed all the house of the Lord, the altar, the burnt vessels, offering, and all the vessels thereof, and the showbread table, and with all the vessels thereof. They cleansed everything out. God wants you to have everything cleansed that is not of the Lord. It needs to be eliminated from your life. Over in Job, chapter 17, verse 9. The righteous also shall hold on his way, He's going to lay, or as Young brings it out, laying hold on his way, because you're going to lay hold on the word, and you're going to walk in the word, you're going to do it. He that hath clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. Notice, as you're walking in line with the word, you're going to be the righteous who's taking hold of the way of the Lord, so you walk in the right way. And then also, as you've been doing the job of getting all this uncleanness out of you and get clean, the clean hands produces you, brings you to the place of being stronger and stronger. So the cleaner you are, the more spiritually strong you are. In the measure that you've done this cleansing work is the measure of spiritual strength that is manifest in you. God wants this, uh, this has got to get done because you're going to become strong and mighty. If you don't get the cleansing done, you'll never have spiritual strength in your life. You may know a lot of things, but it's not getting accomplished until you get this out. Psalms 19, <clears throat> verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean and pure, enduring forever. If you're going to be clean, you've got to have the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. 
That means if you really have the fear of the Lord before you, you're not going to have anything to do with any evil. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride, you should hate that pride. Pride takes you down. Hate arrogancy. Hate the evil way. Hate the froward mouth. God hates these things. It's okay to hate things if you're hating the things that God hates. He wants you to hate these things. We should hate these things. If you hate them enough, you'll have nothing to do with them whatsoever. You will not allow pride or arrogancy or the evil way or a froward mouth occur in your life. We're to hate all these things. We're to be cleansed of everything. And this means even the things that nobody else knows, but you and God, you can't think that they're, well, they, they help, I won't bother with those. No, he wants everything out. Psalms 19, verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Ah, the hidden things. The things that nobody else knows but you and God. Keep that back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright. I shall be innocent from the great transgression. See, we've got to be upright. We've got to deal with all the sin. We've got to get cleansed from all the things on the inside of us. Don't cover things over. Don't sweep things under the rug. Don't just kind of ignore these things that you really need to deal with. Don't get in denial about thing, problems you have when you really do have them. <laughs> You're making a mistake. These secret faults, they need to be dealt with. Everything needs to be put on the table. God wants you totally cleansed from everything in your life. This is essential, as you will see in this next verse. Psalms 24, we come to verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Well, that's in the presence of God. And if you're going to ascend in the hill of the Lord, that's where the Lord is. That's talking about Jerusalem. This is talking about ascending up. Well, that's talking about making it to heaven to be in the new Jerusalem. Who's going to stand in his holy place? Otherwise, who's going to make it to heaven? You could put it in that way. Who's going to get there? Who's going to go up to this? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Who's not lifted up his soul into vanity nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. We're going to be getting his blessings and we're going to be declared righteous. He will see that you are righteous. Why? Because you have clean hands and you have a pure heart. You've got to get your heart dealt with. You've got to get all this evilness out. We must have cleanse, cleansing process go forth in our life. Psalms 51, verse 2. Wash me, kabas, the work of the fooler, to make you white as snow. Wash me thoroughly. Thoroughly, as Young brings it out, from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Everything has to be rooted out. God wants a thorough job being done in you. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop. I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. This is the washing of the fooler. God will wash you clean if you're willing to deal with everything and you're willing to walk in his ways. And what's going to happen is when this gets done, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That was in the Old Testament, a right spirit. Now, of course, we have a, different, we have a new spirit on the inside of us. We don't need a right spirit within us. It is right. We don't sin from our spirit now. But here, notice, he says, says also, create in me a clean heart. You can have filthiness in your heart, remember. You can have double-mindedness or evil heart. You can have doubt in your heart. You can have wickedness in your heart, all kinds of things. So what happens? As you get this cleansing, he's going to bring forth a clean heart before you. Create in me a clean heart. It'll happen as you go through this cleansing process and you get washed thoroughly. Psalms 73, verse 1. Truly, God is good to Israel. And who's the spiritual Israel today? The Israel of God is the church. Even to such are as are of a clean heart. You want God to be good to you? You've got to have a clean heart. 
Is he going to be good to those that aren't having a clean heart? They're walking in sin? No. Does he even listen to those that are doing evil? No. The face of the Lord's against those that do evil, the Bible says. We must have a clean heart. You want God's goodness? And you want to see him do good things for you? It's not just because you're just going to believe that he's going to do it. No, it's because you're going to meet the conditions. It's for those who will have a clean heart before the Lord. Psalms 119, verse 9. So we've got to cleanse our way. It's our responsibility, remember. So in verse 9, he says, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. The word of God is what's going to cleanse you by walking in the correct way instead of walking in a way contrary to the word. As you take heed according to the word, meaning you're a doer of it, that's how you're going to cleanse your way. Just knowing the word but not doing it will not produce cleansing. You must do a, be a doer of the word to see it work and God will accomplish this cleansing in your life. Doers get cleansed. Proverbs chapter 16. You've got to make sure, though, that you don't make a mistake like this. Proverbs 16, 2. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. Remember, you are only clean when, you're, when it's in God's eyes. We saw that scripture previously. You can't look at yourself through your own eyes and say, yeah, I look pretty good. No. You've got to look at yourself through God's eyes. What does he see? And he's looking, remember, for the fruit. He's looking at your works. He's looking at your heart. He's looking at your thoughts. He's looking at your words. He's looking at all the motivations. He's looking at all these things that you're doing. Are you doing what he says? Don't think you're clean in your own eyes just by taking a look at yourself and think, I, I think I'm okay. No. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. He thinks he's okay. You've got to measure up everything you do in line with the word. If it's not in line with the word, you're not okay. You're not clean in the eyes of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 12. There's a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. I'd say we have a generation like that today. We've got a lot of people that they're not, they're not getting washed from their filthiness. They're just putting up with it. They're not crucifying the flesh daily. They're not turning away from the things of the flesh or sin or ways of the world. No. Well, they think they're okay. No. Don't think that you're pure in your own eyes and yet not wash from your filthiness. Until you get washed from your filthiness, you are not pure. You can deceive yourself and believe lies. The devil will deceive you. Remember, especially in the end times, what's the mark of the end times? Deception. Deceiving spirits working continually. Don't think, you know, contrary to the word, and deceive yourself. You are only clean in the measure that you have washed all this filthiness out of your life. Isaiah 1.16 Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. You've got to put these things away. We talked about so many things you put off and you put away. Get rid of all this stuff. Put it all away. If you're continuing to do it, have you put it away? No. Have you washed yourself? No. Are you clean? No. We must put away all this stuff and eliminate it. That means your works are going to show forth and your fruit's going to show forth whether you really have washed and become clean. And whether you cease to do evil, I mean, you don't. Well, I did it for a moment, and then I got back and did it again. Now, you haven't put away the evil yet. And we definitely are not clean before the Lord. Isaiah 52, verse 11. Or well, we could read verse 1 first. We've read this before, but it's a good one. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. You're going to put on holiness, see? For henceforth there shall be no more come unto thee the uncircumcised. That's anything that's not in line with the covenant. Uncircumcised speaks of that that's not of the covenant. 
So are you going to be in fellowship with anything that's not walking in line with the covenant or thing that's of in line with the God, things of God or be with someone who's not walking right with the Lord? No. Otherwise, you're in disobedience. Or are the unclean? And the unclean could be someone who's not born again. Of course, they or someone that's even born again, and he's unclean because he hadn't dealt with himself. That's not someone you're going to have fellowship with. Verse 11. Depart ye, depart ye, go you out from thence. Touch no unclean thing. Stay away from it. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Are you bearing the vessel of the Lord? Is God on the inside of you? Well, we're the temple of God. We've got a brand new spirit, the spirit of Christ. We receive the Holy Spirit. How can we have uncleanness in us if we got the Holy Spirit of God in us? Huh. That's contaminant. That is hindering him. That's shutting him down from doing anything. Notice, you can't touch the unclean thing. He's not going to manifest himself to someone who has uncleanness. Go out of the midst of her. Be clean. You've got to be clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. You can be bearing the vessel of the Lord and unclean because you haven't dealt with yourself. God is not going to be manifesting himself to anybody. He's not going to be doing that if you have not cleansed yourself. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 20. It's quite a statement. They shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations upon horses, chariots, litters, mules, swift beasts, a holy mountain, Jerusalem, saith the Lord, as the children of Israel bring, and notice this part, an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. When they came to bring their offering, they were to bring their offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord. Suppose you bring your offering in an unclean vessel. You're not going to receive it whatsoever. You mean to tell me I can come and bring my offering and I'm an unclean vessel and God's not going to receive it? Nope. Notice that. Bring an offering in a clean vessel. You've got to be a clean vessel. You can't just do it your way. You've got to be right before the Lord. Clean vessel under the house of the Lord. He wants every one of us to get washed clean. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 14. O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from wickedness. Notice the next part. That thou mayest be saved. Well, now we're really hitting home on something. If you don't wash your heart from the wickedness, are you going to be saved? Not according to this one. If you don't meet the condition of washing your heart from the wickedness, that, this is what follows it, meaning the condition is pre prior to that, that thou mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? You're to guard your mind and your thoughts. You can't have these kind of evil thoughts on the inside of you. You can't be letting these things come into you, these evil thoughts, because they affect your heart. Whatever you're thinking upon, all these members you're yielding to are gates coming into your heart. So you need to govern your mind. You need to be, make sure you're thinking on the right things. You're governing, you're guarding yourself. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. And notice, you've got to wash your heart from wickedness that you might be saved. Yeah, that means people that haven't washed their heart, they're in trouble. Come over to the New Testament in Matthew chapter 5. And we can see this very same statement essentially made here. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Well, suppose somebody's not pure and clean in heart. They won't see God. Obviously, the opposite. The condition is, be pure and clean in heart. The result is, for meeting the condition, you'll see God. If you aren't, are you going to see God? No. Matthew chapter 23, verse 25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He called these guys on the carpet because they were hypocritical. For you make clean the outside of the cup and the platter. Oh, you make everything look good on the outside. But within, uh, that's where God's looking, remember. They're full of extortion and excess. 
Excess is interesting. It means a lack, a want, or a lack of self-control. They're intemperate. You can't show one way and then you're totally different. You're out of control. You're not in control whatsoever. You're to be temperate in all things, remember. If you're going to go in and run the race to possess the prize, it talks about in 1 Corinthians 9. Therefore, we can't be full of any of these things, extortion, plundering, robbery, or not being in self-control. We can't just be making clean things on the outside. He says, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. We've got to cleanse the inside. We've got to be dealing with everything on the inside of you. Everything's got to be cleansed. We come to John 13, a highly misunderstood passage of Scripture. People have not understood this in most cases. Here in John 13, people have thought that this is talking about washing your feet, and that makes you humble before God if someone washes your feet. It has nothing to do with that whatsoever. It's all a false teaching. John 13, verse 5. This is Jesus. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel. It was a linen cloth wherewith he was girded. So what's he doing here? He's coming to be washing. And when we talk about this washing, this is ongoing, present tense. He's continually washing. It's a spiritual revelation. He is washing continually the disciples' feet. What does your feet refer to? Your walk. Your walking, the way you walk in your life. And what happens if you don't walk in the right way of the Lord? You'll get dirty. You'll get unclean because you have sinned. So he's washing the effects of their walk. You and I got to get washed of the effects of our walk if we don't walk in the ways of the Word and we end up sinning. And notice what he uses. He uses this linen cloth. The linen cloth. Linen speaks of righteousness. That's what's going to cleanse you. And notice, this is the, the towel that he was girded with. So, that tells you he had girded him, oh, himself with this thing. And who actually had girded himself with it? Not him, because it's a passive voice. The passive voice means the person it's talking about, who is Jesus, was girded by somebody else. Who girded him? The Father did, through the Word of God. And also, was this just something that he just did at that moment, or that whatever, that wasn't, you know, not just talking about like he's wearing something? No. It's a spiritual revelation, because it's a perfect tense verb. The perfect tense means completed action in the past, however long it took, ongoing action, with present effects at the time of speaking. Meaning, Jesus was girded in the past continually with this linen towel, which is righteousness, because he was walking in righteousness, with the present effects at that time. Otherwise, it's saying Jesus was walking in righteousness all the time, and now he's coming, and it's because he walked in the Word, the Father had girded him with this. He was righteous. And so he's bringing this to wash these guys. How it's going to wash you? Righteousness is going to get rid of what? Unrighteousness. Get rid of the filth. Sin is unrighteous. All this filthiness is all unrighteousness in our life. So, this is talking about him washing these guys from their walk, from their sins. Come down to verse 7. Jesus answered and said, What I do thou knowest not now, but you'll know hereafter. Otherwise, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but you'll know it later, which would be at later on after they all got born again. They didn't know or understand these things. Well, Peter said, Thou shalt never wash my feet, he thought that was like an insult kind of a thing, you know. Just, you shouldn't be washing my feet. 
Look at Jesus' answer. He, didn't pay. he knows what he's talking about in the natural, but Jesus is responding now because remember what he was talking about was washing you of all your sin and your filthiness from your walk. Jesus answered and said, If I wash you not, and this is subjunctive mood, meaning if I might not wash you, if it doesn't get done, you have no part with me. Meaning, <laughs> I have nothing to do with you. You have, no, you have nothing to do with me. And this is a present tense verb would be translated, you are having no part with me. What does that mean? If you're not getting washed, you're not having any part with Jesus. You're just walking around in sin in the flesh and unrighteousness. So that means we must get washed. If I might not wash you, you're having no part with me. You got to get washed to have part with Jesus. All believers must be washed in their walk if you're going to be have part with him. We come to verse 10. Jesus said to him, "He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all." He says, what he means not save or accept, but to wash his feet. The reason being, when it talks about washed here, it's, diff it's talking about the word luo, which means to be bathed. Bathed. And this is talking, referring to the fact that someone who has been bathed, and this is the word used when it talks about the washing of regeneration in Titus, which is talking about the new birth when you get born again. You're washed totally because the old spirit's taken out and a new spirit comes into you. This is talking, he says, he that's been born again in so many words is what he's saying. He needed not save to wash his feet. He, the only thing he really needs to do is wash his walk. Otherwise, you aren't going to wash your spirit and get a new spirit because your spirit's right with God, see? You're not going to do that whatsoever. In fact, we'll just show you this. We'll come back here in a moment. Titus 3, verse 5. When it speaks by the washing... I got the cursor over the word washing. It's lutron, a form of that, which refers to the bathing, the whole person. And what is the lutron bathing talking about? Of regeneration, which is what? The new birth. So it's talking about being born again. That's what he's, the statement he's making. Of course, they didn't understand what he was saying then, but he was speaking all these things into being. They'd understand it all later down the road. So he that has been bathe such that he got born again, when that happens down the road. He doesn't need to get bathed again. The only thing he needs is to wash his feet. Otherwise, the sin that he commits in his walk. That's, so you got, you got to walk, get washed of all these things. Then we come down to verse 12. So after he had washed their feet and taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know you what I've done to you? Or are you knowing what I've done to you more literally? Of course they didn't. And so he comes down to verse 14. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, meaning if I ministered to you to cleanse, see you get cleansed of all your evil walks, evil sinful ways in your walk, I ministered to you, you ought also to wash one another's feet. Otherwise, you're going to minister to other people to help them get cleansed. That's essentially what he's saying. Otherwise, this is going to be your ministry. He's telling them. You're going to be doing this. Now, in doing this, he's not talking about foot washing in the natural. He says, for I have given you an example. I've given you this example that you should do as I have done to you, which was what the revelation is, that spiritually washing them from all their filthiness from their walk. Which is what, because he said, you don't know what I'm doing for you. He wasn't just doing this foot washing thing. This is a spiritual revelation of what he's doing. And he said, if you don't get washed, you don't even have any part of me. Washing your feet would have nothing to do with having part with someone, you know, in the natural. We're talking about spiritually. So he's given us an example that you may be doing this. And so notice he didn't say, do what I just said, but instead he's saying that instead you're going to be doing as 
this as I have done to you as an example, which is ministering what? The spiritual washing of the cleansing to others, not foot washing. These people have had foot washing things they don't understand. They have just been, they haven't had the revelation of these things. And then he comes down to verse 17, and he says, if you know these things, or more literally, this is the word oida, which means to perceive, to produce, you come into the place of knowing, and it's a perfect tense verb, meaning that you have perceived to bring you to the place of knowing something. If you have perceived this to come to the place of knowing these things, which they would get down the road, blessed, happy is the word makarios, it means blessed, blessed are you if you are doing them if you may be doing them, present tense, continually, and it's a subjunctive mood, meaning you're going to be blessed if you may be doing these things of what? Ministering to other people to help them get free of their uncleanness. Because this is your ministry, see? This is what this is all about. You're going to be blessed. We're not, again, we're not talking about foot washing. washing. Washing, does that bring blessings upon me? No. Well, did, when you went were in the shower today or whatever, did you get blessed just because you washed your feet? No, not talking about that, see? It's because you're doing a spiritual ministry to people. And then he comes down to verse 20 and he says this, Verily, verily, I say unto he that receives whomsoever I send, someone coming to minister to you, receives me. You're receiving Jesus because Jesus is the Word. He's coming to minister to you according to the Word. And he that receives me receives him that sent me, which is the Father. So you're receiving Jesus and the Father through the Word that is being ministered to you for them to accomplish the work in your life. You want to receive the Word of God to bring the cleansing to you. This is the work of the Father and Jesus Christ to see you be set free. Most people don't have any idea about what John 13 is all about because they haven't understood these things. John 15. Here he speaks about every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away. Uh, if you don't bear fruit, you're in trouble. You're not going to be saved. Obviously, if you're taken away. That means you're not attached to the vine any longer. The branch got cut off. Every branch that bears fruit, because you're doing the Word, he purges it or cleanses it. Remember, we've got to get cleansed of all this stuff, that it may bring forth more fruit. In other words, you're not going to bring forth more fruit if you continue to have this uncleanness in your life. You've got to, as you're starting to see some fruit, You've got to get this uncleanness out so you can bring forth more fruit. And again, of course, the natural things give us an example. What do you do? You cut off the dead stuff so then your plant can produce more fruit. You don't leave the dead wood on there. It's going to be a hindrance to it. You cut off that which is not good. That's the cleansing or the purging of it. Just like they prune the, tr prune the trees and vines from the useless shoots, as it points out there, there in, in underneath there in the lower part. Well, he wants to get rid of all the things that are not of God. You must go through this cleansing process. Now, in verse 3, he says, Now, you're clean through the word that I've spoken unto you. Let's take, we've got to stop and look at this for a moment. This doesn't mean just because you heard the word that automatically cleansed me. No. You are Clean, the word through is the word dia in the Greek. Dia, when it has a genitive in the Greek following it, it means through. If it has an accusative case in the noun following it, then it means because of. And that's what it is in this case. Here's dia, it's a preposition, and here we see, here's the accusative talking about the Word. So this is why tra Young's translates it because of. That makes a big difference. We're not talking about through the Word. We're talking about because of the Word. 
In other words, the word came to you, and obviously if it's because of the word, then the word must be having to do something in your life to bring this forth. You're clean because of the word which I have spoken unto you. When he talks about what I've spoken unto you, this again is the perfect tense. Now, whenever we bring up the perfect tense, you've got to pay attention. The perfect tense means action completed in the past, however long, with present results at the time of speaking. In other words, the implication is, as the word was spoken to you in the past, you took hold of it and did it, and it's been working in you with the results now, because this is the way you are, the present results. So what it's saying is, you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you in the past, that you obviously took hold of and put into operation, doing it in your life, to see this produce this cleanness, the word produce the cleanness, and it's evident in your life because that's the way things are right now at this point in time when I'm speaking. That's what it's talking about. In other words, it's because of you hearing and doing the word and continuing in it. That's what produces the cleansing in your life. Not just because I heard the word. I mean, the devil comes to take it out. It may not stay. You've got to do it and incorporate it in your lifestyle and walk it out continually walking in the ways of the Word of God so you will walk in the way of righteousness. And that'll produce the cleansing because you've repented and turned from it and you're walking uprightly before the Lord. Here's another thing that's important. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're talking about a very important subject of you coming to the place of being clean and white, which is of a necessity for you to make it to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Hmm. Yeah, that's why we have to pay attention to all this. In fact, he says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? They don't make it, do they? What's unrighteousness? Sin. Unrighteous are those that are, have sin in their life. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Why would it say be not deceived? Because people think, oh, everybody's going to make it. No, they're not. <laughs> the unrighteous are not going to make it. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, that is a homosexual. One who lies with a male is with a female. Thieves, covetous, you can't be covetous. Drunkards, or this is the word from the word methe, which means intoxicated. It's not just talking about someone who's running around drop dead drunk, you know. It's someone who's intoxicated in any capacity. You should not want to be intoxicated whatsoever, ever. Nor the revilers, railers, nor extortioners or robbers shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, <coughs> next thing he says is this. He says, such were some of you. Some of you, this is the way you were. Does that mean they were doomed forever? No. Can we get cleansed and washed of everything? Yes. Notice what it says after this. I'll read the whole thing through and then we'll go back and comment. But you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. Well, how did that happen? Did God wash them, sanctify them, and justify them by himself? With them doing nothing? No. How do you know? We put the cursor over this word, washed. You washed away or washed off middle voice. The middle, the voices are important. There's an active voice, the subject's doing the action. There's a passive voice, somebody's doing the action to the subject. If it's the middle voice, the subject is doing the action for his own benefit. And that's what it is here. Meaning that you washed for yourself. You did it. Remember who's supposed to do the cleansing? You're supposed to cleanse yourselves. You're supposed to wash yourselves through the Word of God, right? So when you got the washing done, that's your responsibility. How about the sanctification? You're sanctified. Well, let's take a look at this one. Is this something that you did for yourself? No, because that's a passive voice. Somebody else did it to you. Who? The Lord. And how about the justified? Did you do something to, for you to be declared righteous? No. Passive voice. The Lord did that. In other words, what this really should be saying clearly is that you washed for yourself. 
and you were sanctified by the Lord and justified by the Lord in the name of the Lord Jesus. Why? Because you did the washing. In other words, will you be sanctified and justified or declared righteous by the Lord if you don't do the washing? No. It's mandatory that you do the washing or you will not be sanctified and you will not be justified before the Lord if you don't. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them. And what's he talking about coming out from? He's talking about coming out from the things we shouldn't have anything to do with. We go back to verse 14. You're not supposed to be yoked together with unbelievers. Righteousness cannot have fellowship with lawlessness, anomia. Anybody that's walking in lawlessness, contrary to the word. Know what communion is light with darkness? Anybody walking in darkness? No, you don't want to have anything to do with that. Any agreement with Christ, with Belial, or anybody that's worthless, walk, not walking in the ways of the Lord? What part is he that believeth with an infidel or someone who is unfaithful? This is really the word for unfaithful. It means they're not walking in line with the word. Because the word, the word peace, Pistis is the word for pistis is the word for faith. Pistos is the word meaning faithful. And this is a pistos. Apostos, the way you pronounce it, but that's the a is meaning not. Meaning he's not faithful. We're not gonna have any faith, uh, fellowship with faithful unfaithful people. What agreement has the temple of God which you are with idols? Nothing. You're the temple of the living God. As God said, I'll dwell with them and walk in them and I'll be their God and they should be my people. Is God going to walk in those that are walking around with idols? No way. Wherefore, come out from among them. You come out from all these. And be separate, which means to mark off from others by boundaries. Alfredzo. You set the boundaries. You can't be crossing the boundaries just because you, you know, I don't care if they're a relative, I don't care if they're mother, father, son, daughter, you know, co-worker, friend for 25 years. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Who are you serving? What family do you belong to? Remember, Jesus said, he didn't give his mother and brother the time of day. He said, behold, my mother and my brother and my sisters are the ones who are hearing and doing and keeping the word. Spiritual family. Be separate, mark off from boundaries from all this, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. What does that mean? Something that's not cleansed. If it's not cleansed, hands off. Don't get it, don't touch it. And I will receive you. That means if you are touching unclean things, is he going to receive you? No. Well, I'm just going to believe God's going to receive me. Well, it doesn't matter what you believe. If you haven't met the conditions, it's not going to happen. And I'll be a father unto you, and you'll be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. This is the Almighty God, omnipotent uh, ruler of all. Man, he'll manifest himself in power and ruling as a father to his sons and daughters, if you meet the conditions. And then he comes to 7.1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, what promises? The promises of what he'll do for us. He'll be a father to us. He'll be the Lord Almighty who will rule and reign over your enemies. Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. It means that we better do this. Let us cleanse ourselves. When it says cleanse ourselves, this is a subjunctive mood, meaning it's conditional. Might you cleanse yourself? You could translate it when it's a conditional statement. Might you cleanse yourself because you got all these promises? You want to see these promises come to pass? Might you cleanse yourselves? It's your job to do it. From all filthiness, that's uncleanness, isn't it? Of the flesh, every fleshly work's got to go. And spirit, what's the filthiness of the spirit? All the evil spirits that are in us that have to be cast out. Because there's no filthiness in your spirit, the spirit of Christ, it's the evil spirits. What's going to be the result of you getting all this filthiness out? You're going to perfect holiness in the fear of God. And every one of us are come to come to the place of being holy. 
James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Sinners is not talking about someone who's a sinner by nature. It's talking about one who is, has sinful ones who are not free from sin. They're walking in sin. That's what it's talking about. So, get rid of it. Purify your hearts, you double-minded or two-souled daisukos. You're supposed to be single-souled on the things of God. Not sometimes walking with God and sometimes I'm, my mind's over here doing all the th other things that I want to do. You see, you've got to be single-minded if you're going to have a pure heart. If, you gotta, if you're double-minded or you're double-souled, you won't have a pure heart. Your heart will not be pure before the Lord. So we've got to cleanse ourselves from all that. Titus, chapter 1, verse 15. Unto the pure, all things are pure. Well, that's because they're dedicated to walk in the ways of what's holy and what's right. They're clean. They're, they're going to be focused. Every, they're, everything they're going to follow after is going to be that. But unto those that are defiled, they're unclean, right? And unbelieving is nothing pure. Even their mind and their conscience is defiled. You can be a Christian and be defiled and your mind and your conscience is defiled. In fact, you can get to the place where your conscience is so seared, as it says, you, you're not even convicted of the sin. You'll just, you, you'll just lie, you'll just cheat, you'll just use people, manipulate people, speak things, do things, whatever you want, and it really doesn't even phase you so much. It's, well, it's amazing that Christians can get to that place. And we've seen them. Why? Because their conscience gets so seared, their mind and conscience gets so defiled because they've been walking in uncleanness continually. You know, it accumulates. <sighs> Repentance is the name of the game for those anybody like this. They profess they know God. These ones say, oh, I know God. No, you don't. You, you say you know God. It means nothing. How do we going to know? In works, they deny Him. You got the works, you got the fruit. Being abominable, disobedient, unto every good work, not approved. Reprobate means not approved. Oh, look, you say you know God. Look at all this. You're doing this, you're doing that, you're doing this, you're doing it, you're not doing this and all that. You tell me you're, you know God. You're deceived. Your mind and conscience has been defiled. There's a lot of Christians, unfortunately, that are like that. They're in trouble if they don't get, repent, get themselves right. Titus 2.14, speaking about Jesus, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all lawlessness. Iniquity is lawlessness, anomia. He has, but there's more that he wants to do. And purify, subjunctive mood, might purify if the conditions are met. It's not automatic. You've got to meet the conditions. Might purify unto himself, because you've got to cleanse yourself, remember. Himself, a peculiar people. A peculiar people. A peculiar people is a people, if you notice down here, selected by God for his own possessions. Otherwise, you've been chosen. Remember, many are called, but only few are chosen. So this is a people who have been purified unto himself that he has chosen. He wants everybody to be chosen, but unfortunately, as the Word says, many are called and only few are chosen. Why? Because they didn't purify themselves. If you don't purify yourself, you won't be chosen. You won't be one of those selected by God for His own possession. And evidence of that will be you'll be zealous for good works. You'll want to do what the Word says all the time. You want to hear the Word, you want to do the Word, you want to walk in the Word. This is your life. If that's not you, you are in trouble. Look at zealous means you're burning with zeal. I mean, the word's your life. That's what you do. If the word's not your life, what happened to you? Where are you? <laughs> that person's in trouble. They aren't seeing the work of God be accomplished in their life whatsoever. 
God wants to do a total purging job. And if he does this job, it's going to clean up your conscience. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge, make clean your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? What's evidence that you've really been cleaned in your conscience? You'll be wanting to do the dead works, or excuse me, you'll be wanting to do the good works and serving God. You won't be doing the dead works and doing your own thing. Meaning if you're doing a bunch of dead works and you're not serving God, looking at your works, you got a rotten consciousness. Your conscience is defiled. You got to get it cleansed from all the dead works. You can't have dead works. And then of course, you won't be able to serve God until you do get the cleanness out, uncleanness out, remember? It's mandatory. First Peter, Chapter 1, verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls. Oh, that's getting rid of everything bad out of affecting my will, mind, and emotions. You get rid of the I, 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 the me, 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 what I want. I want this, you know, all this. We're to live unto him, not unto ourself. How do you get purify yourself, your souls? In obeying the truth. Through the Spirit, because we walk in the Spirit, according to the Word of God. You're in obeying the truth. The obedience to the truth causes the purification of your soul. If you're not obeying the Word and everything, your soul is messed up big time. It is not getting purified at all. We must come in line with what he says. And then we come down to James chapter 1, verse 27. Pure religion or clean. And when it talks about religion, this is really talking about, don't think of it in a negative sense. It's really talking about religious discipline. Clean religious discipline, meaning, hey, you've really seen this work be done in you. It's been accomplished in you. I mean, if you've got the discipline, it's like you're a disciple. A clean, pure disciple, you could say, essentially say, and undefiled before God. Ah, they've cleansed themselves out. And the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. They're out there reaching out to people, doing the work, serving God. And also to keep himself unspotted from the world. You don't let anything come on you to get you contaminated. Because you know you, gotta, you cannot be unclean. You can't touch any unclean things. You've got to stay away from it. You set the boundaries. You don't touch the unclean things. That is one who has pure religious discipline. He's walking in the ways of the Lord. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. If we walk in the light, when it talks about walking in the light, this is present tense. Ongoing, walking continually. Subjunctive mood, condition. If we may be continually walking in the light, literally what you, how you would translate it. If you may continually be walking the light as he's in the light, because that's what he walks after, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses you, continually keeps you in that state of being cleansed, present tense, from all sin. You won't walk in sin any longer. You will stay cleansed. You will stay in fellowship with God, in fellowship one with another, if you're walking continually in the light. And how do you do that? You walk and lie with the Word. How about the guy who has sinned? Well, he can do something. God's made a way. But we've got to understand what this verse says. If we confess our sins, well, that's going to be a subjunctive mood statement to begin with because that's conditional. If you don't confess your sins and you just can keep on covering them over and don't deal with them, you're abiding in unrighteousness continually and you're not clean at all. If we might continually, whenever we can do it, confess our sins, we confess our sins to God, to the Father in the name of Jesus, He is faithful and righteous, what will he do? He'll do the word, won't he? 
Then it says to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Does that mean if I just confess my sins, it's automatically going to happen? No. How can you say that? Because it's a bad translation. Forgive. If this is correct, to forgive is an infinitive, isn't it? Is this an infinitive? No. It's a subjunctive mood verb. Meaning that he might forgive us. If we might confess our sins, he's faithful and just, that he might forgive you your sins, if you meet the conditions, and he might, subjunctive mood, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That means number one condition is to confess your sins. But then there's two more that conditions got to be met. You got to meet the conditions for you to be forgiven, and you got to meet the conditions for you to be cleansed from all unrighteousness. What's going to be the condition for you to be forgiven? You're going to have to repent and turn away from it. You got to have a heart that's turning away from it. Can you just confess my sins and keep doing it? No, you haven't repented. How do you show forth repentance? By fruits and by works. By the change. Repentance means change. How about the cleansing from all unrighteousness? Just because I confess my sins, am I cleansed from every, all the unrighteousness and all the effects of it? No. You're going to have to put away all the unrighteous stuff and you're going to have to cast out all these unrighteous devils that are un filthy devils, unclean devils, to get free of it, to get cleansed. In other words... There's a, pro, there's a work to be done here to see us come to the place of being cleansed. The cleansing isn't just because I confessed my sins. People have not understood this because they didn't look at the word and see what was said. 2 Peter 1.8 Talking about the word, if it's in you, it, you won't be barren or you won't be unfruitful in the precise, correct knowledge of God. It'll be working in your life. But if you lack these things, you know, where, where's the fruit? Where's the, where are you, where's the evidence that you're doing something? Otherwise, we don't see any of this fruit. You're blind. Remember, this is the guy, these things were in him and abounding. These things aren't in you and abounding because you're not doing them. He that lacks these things, he's blind. Remember the guy who's blind? It's one of the characteristics of the guy that gets spewed out of his mouth over there in, in Revelation chapter 3, Laodicea in church. He's spiritually blind, he cannot see afar off, and he's even forgotten that he was purged or cleansed from his old sins. Why? Because he's right back in them again. <laughs> he's back in the same boat again. He's not cleansed whatsoever. He's filthy. He's in trouble. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence. Instead, he's saying, this is what you should be doing. Give diligence to be making present tense, for yourself, middle voice, to be making for yourself, because this is important for you, your calling and your being chosen, what that means, so election, I can remember it's not guaranteed, many are called but only few are chosen, the only guys that get chosen are the ones who meet the conditions. Sure. Stable, fast, firm, set. Well, how could I do that? For if you are doing continually these things, all the things that was talking about of the Word of God, you might never fall. Not that you shall never fall. It's the word here. This is the word about fall. It is not a future tense verb. If it was, it would be future tense. It is a subjunctive mood verb, which means you might never fall. I mean, if you're not doing these things, you're already in a state of falling. And if you continually do these things, yeah, that means you're going to be right with God, but it's not mean forever. If you, might not, you might never fall if you keep doing them. That's what it's saying, essentially. If you don't keep doing them, well, you could be right back in the same old boat again and fall again, and then you're in trouble again. God wants us to get ourselves 
cleansed. 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. Flee also useful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that are calling upon. Continually calling upon, present tense, middle voice for yourself. This is all for yourself, your benefit, on the Lord out of a pure heart, clean heart. You've got to have a clean heart. That's the only way you're going to be right with God. Remember, the guy who's not pure in heart, he's not going to see God. Only the pure in heart will see God. They're in trouble otherwise. A couple more scriptures. When the time comes for the Lord to come back, Remember, before that, the church is going to have a judgment. The judgment comes to the church before it comes to the world. Malachi 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger. He shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in, behold, he shall come. He's going to come. He's going to come to the church, remember, to find out whether the church is walking right or not. Who may abide the day of his coming? Because what's he coming to do? And what's he coming to find? Who shall stand when he appears? Well, if you haven't worked yourself, your salvation out, if you haven't cleansed yourself and made yourself pure by doing righteousness and got all this filthiness out of you, are you going to be able to stand? No. For he is like a refiner's fire. He's coming to test and prove and find out and to bring you to the place of being right with him. And like fuller's soap, the fuller's soap who washes you white as clean. He's coming to deal with every error in your life and wash you clean. If it doesn't happen, you're going to be in trouble. He shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi, that's all the priests, and purge them as gold and silver. They've got to be cleansed and purged. That they may offer... Unto the Lord, and uh, they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Meaning, when Jesus comes back to his church, what's he going to do? He's going to test you, he's going to cleanse you, he's going to purge you, he's going to purify you. Because if you're going to come and be with him, you're going to be an offering in righteousness to him. If you're not righteous, you're not going to be the bride. Remember, the bride was given unto her to make her, to, to array herself as, with this fine linen by the righteous acts to be clean and white. Meaning, what's the bride going to do? She's going to be an offering in righteousness to the bridegroom. Is Jesus going to take anybody who's not an offering, who's not righteous as an offering? Oh, here. An unclean thing? No way. He's not going to take any unclean thing at all. In fact, in Matthew 22, here we see the picture when the king comes in to see who's all for the wedding. The king came in to see the guests. He saw a man there that had not on a wedding garment. Well, if you're coming to the wedding, you've got to have the wedding garment on. Otherwise, you're not going to be coming in there. You're going to be kicked out. Had on is the word and duo, which means to clothe oneself. Middle voice, clo clo uh, to, uh, clen to clothe yourself for your benefit. And also, what else does this tell you? The perfect tense. The perfect tense, you've got to pay attention Perfect tense means action completed in the past with present effects at that point in time. Meaning, he saw this guy who had not in the past done what was necessary to clothe himself with a wedding garment. And that's the state he's at at that point in time. And he thinks he's coming to the wedding because he hasn't clean, in clean, he's not white. 
No way. What's he say to this guy? He said to a friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? What's going on here? You're not having a wedding garment. Having is continually. You're supposed to continually be white and clean as snow and righteous. He was speechless. Anybody that not is like this will be speechless too. What happened to him? He said to the king, to the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's not saved. He's thrown out. He's finished. Because he didn't clothe himself in the fine linen, clean, white, before the Lord, holy before the Lord. He's not right. You and I must be washed. Daniel. Daniel speaks of end time things that are going to happen. Daniel 12, verse 10. This is when it's talking about the end times and all these things are going to happen. He taught the, the words were closed up till the time of the end. But he says what's going to happen. Many shall be purified. They're going to be made white. They're going to be tried because the refiner's coming to try everybody. But the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise will understand. You and I are going to be the wise. We understand what has to be done. We're going to be purified. We're going to be made white. We're going to be tried and proved and tested. God's going to find out who are the real righteous, clean, white ones and who aren't. Revelation 3, verse 4. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. Only a few. Remember, the few are the ones that are saved and the many are the ones that are in trouble. They shall walk with me in white. Light, brilliant, for they are worthy. That meant they went through the cleansing process. They were walking in righteousness. They dealt with all the filthiness and got rid of it. They didn't defile their garments. They walk with me in white. They're worthy. And then he goes on and says, He that overcomes, this means to conquer and carry off the victory. And this does, oh, it means I won a battle once? No. Present tense. He who is continually conquering and carrying off the victory ongoing. The same, that guy, shall be clothed in white raiment. He's got this bright, brilliant, that's the, the white. Well, that's what the wedding dress is all about, the linen garments for the, for the wedding. And what happens? He's going to be with the Lord. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life because he's going to be received, isn't he? But I'll confess his name before my father and before the angels. And he's going to come to the marriage. How about the guy that's not clothed with the white raiment? And he's one of the group that's defiled their garments and hasn't gotten clean. His name's going to get blotted out of the book of life. And he will not be confessed before the Father and before his angels. He's going to be one of those cast them out into outer darkness. He is going to be in trouble. God wants us to see how important it is for you to understand, you must cleanse yourself. The marriage of the Lamb has come. The wife has made herself ready and prepared. That's your job and my job. To her was given that she might be arrayed and clothed in fine linen, clean and white. You've got to be clean and white. Because look who's coming back when the Lord's coming back and they're going to make war. Jesus is coming, and the armies, that's you and I, after the marriage supper of the Lamb, having been made white and clean, followed him on white sources, horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. If you haven't made yourself white and clean, you won't be there. We must do this. You're going to do it through the Word of God. 
God's going to do the work in you. He will accomplish it if you and I carry out what he says. This is an extremely important message tonight. It's been a very strong, powerful message as well. We are responsible to cleanse ourselves, to purify ourselves, to make sure that we are walking and we have cleansed ourselves of all the filthiness out of our life. We are the ones who are supposed to deal with everything and not let any uncleanness be in us whatsoever. If we're not washed, we're in trouble. If we haven't cleansed ourselves, we haven't put the wedding garment on. And if we haven't done that, you won't be welcomed into the marriage supper of the Lamb. But you and I are going to make the right decisions. We are going to cleanse ourselves of everything. Do not touch any clean, unclean things. Set the boundaries and don't be giving place to the devil. That means you can't just do what you want. You live under the Lord. You walk in His ways. You're obedient to all the things. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks. You're going to do what the Word says. That's it. You're following the Lord. That is what is expected for all of us. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings forth the truth that it is of a necessity for me to be clean and white by doing righteousness. So I am clothed in the fine linen that I am righteous and holy and white and clean before the Lord. I will be ready and prepared because I will get rid of all filthiness, all uncleanness, everything will be purged out of my life and I will walk in the ways of the Lord and it will be seen by my fruit, by my works, by my whole life that I have truly repented, that I am walking in the ways of the Lord. I will not touch any unclean things. I set the boundaries. I will walk the straight and narrow path. I will be one of the few who will walk uprightly before you in obedience. I thank you that I will cleanse myself from all filthiness, every devil, Every filthy thing in the soulish realm, it's all going to be rooted out. So I will be clean and white, having the linen garments on, clothed in righteousness, so that I will be in the marriage supper of the Lamb, and I will be with the Lord forever. Thank you for performing your word in my life as I do what your word says. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Take heed to the word of God this night. Father, I thank you that every person who hears this has ears to hear and understands the importance of going through the cleansing process, becoming white and white as snow. We thank you. We'll be doers of the word. We will see this great work be accomplished in all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.